Falcons is reporting 3,326 new cases of COVID-19 today, pushing the seven-day average to nearly 3,400 cases. Now, 62 people have died as well since the last report. Here's the regional breakdown. 968 new cases in Toronto, 572 in Peel, and 357 in York Region. The testing today is based on more than 71,000 being completed. Now, a stay-at-home order came into effect at midnight right across Ontario. And in the last half hour, you may have received this message as the province sent out an alert about the new measures. The message is used to notify people of emergencies like Amber Alerts was sent to phones and was broadcast on television and radio at about 10 o'clock this morning, reminding people to stay home. Now, the order, which will last at least 28 days, is the cornerstone of the province's latest push to curb the climbing cases of COVID-19 that are overwhelming the healthcare system. There are also new rules surrounding non-essential retail stores and students across southern Ontario. They will remain at home for online learning until February 10th. Now, Toronto's interim chief has tweeted today, please do your part and stay home. If we all limit our travel to essential reasons, we can limit the spread of COVID-19. Toronto police will continue to enforce the provincial and public health orders. More details to come. And the new provincial order impacts the construction industry. So for more on the rules around what's being built and what can't be, let's check in with CP24. Steve Ryan. Morning, Steve. Good morning, Nick. This is day one of the new restrictions that came into place uh, this morning with regards to the stay-at-home order and it also restricts which businesses can continue to operate. One of them is the construction industry with some exceptions and those are if the construction site already has its footing uh, permits it can continue or if it's basically an essential site that needs to be built the example would be uh, infrastructure bridges uh, hospitals schools things of, of that nature now you can see this site behind me here on queen's key it's very very busy and uh, everybody is abiding by the rules that were uh, given to us by the province the other day and stressed by the premier with regards to uh, work sites being inspected um, everybody that we could see at this particular site is social distancing wearing their masks and there are a couple of hand washing uh, sites on site as well i happened to see them this morning when i got closer to there and i had a chance finally to uh, talk to a couple of the uh, workers this morning and they are thankful for a couple of things number one they said they're thankful they still have their jobs and uh, number two, uh, they're, they're thankful that they are able to practice these safe conditions as they always have so that they don't take anything home with them. Next, we'll start back to you. Yeah, that's the plan. Okay, thanks so much, Steve. Now, as the stay-at-home order kicks in, there are still concerns about overcrowding on board the TTC. And while ridership's down, it seems to still be an issue. GME is live now from the Jane and Finch area with more on this. G, good morning. Good morning, Nick. Uh, we've been here for a little while and we have seen several buses roll by here in the Jane and Finch area. Uh, to be honest, we haven't seen overcrowded buses, but we have had a chance to speak to some passengers and they say, yes, they have experienced overcrowding and they've also seen people going onto the buses without masks. So a lot of concern here, including the union that represents the TTC workers. So joining me now is Carlos Santos with ATU Local 113. Thank you so much for joining us. So what are your members telling you what are they concerned about? Hi, good morning, G. Thank you for having me. Uh, the majority of complaints that I've been hearing from our members out there are customers are getting on vehicles and many of them are not wearing masks or when they are wearing masks, they're, they're putting it below their, no, their nose and they're, they're starting to read, read a book or something. And what we want is we want to make sure that customers that are wearing masks to keep that mask on. Uh, we're also getting lots of, uh, we're still getting photos of overcrowded vehicles. Maybe you haven't seen any today. Um, so we've been asking for the same safety precautions that we had back in March last year. And uh, uh, it's just absurd that the TTC and, and Rick Leary would not re-implement the same safety precautions that we had a year ago or 10 months ago when we had 300 COVID cases a day in Ontario. And now we're at, you know, we're averaging 3,000, which is 10 times the amount. We're asking, uh, we're asking the TTC to block off the seats behind the drivers. There's already markers on there that say do not sit here. And, and customers are, are still sitting there because it's not, it should be completely blocked off. We're asking them to implement rear door loading again unless customers have an accessibility issue. We're asking uh, again.
again, we've mentioned the enforcement of, of masks, but we're also we're also asking to eliminate cash fares and transfers and fare boxes because ninety percent of the revenue is being paid through Presto. So uh, these are the TTC has a responsibility to its employees to minimize the risk. I, I don't see them minimizing anything at, at this time. How are your members feeling about that? That uh, some of these things, these things that the union is asking for, and you're saying that the TTC hasn't followed up on it. I, I can see the frustration when I go out there. So just put yourself in, in an operator's position where you're driving a vehicle and you're getting written up because you put your mask below your 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 nose to breathe. You're in that. You're wearing that mask ten hours a day. You look behind you. You have five customers not wearing a mask. But yet our our members are, are being written up, they're being warned. Uh, the TTC has gone on this campaign, this physical distancing audits at our work locations on our own employees. What they should be doing is, phys is physical distancing audits in public spaces, on TTC public spaces and TTC vehicles. That's where the real audits should be done, not turn this around and blame this on the employees. And we had a chance to speak with TTC riders. They said one of their biggest issue that they've heard in terms of uh, members of their group is that not enough people are wearing masks and, and it's difficult to enforce that. Well, what we could do is we can have we can have special constables that, that are, are supposed to be collecting fares. They could go on there and remind customers to, to put the mask on or even ask them, why are you not wearing a mask? Do you have a medical condition that stops you from wearing masks? We need a, we need a better... We need not just enforcement, but we, we do need an education on, on wearing masks as well. We need to get customers to wear masks. All right, Carlos Santos with ATU Local 113. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Take care. And Nick, we'll send it back to you. Yeah, he raises a lot of points there. Okay, G, thank you. Now, infectious diseases specialist, Dr. Abu Sharkawi, questions the effectiveness of the new measures. I'm very concerned about people who work in the essential work environment in hard hit uh, hot zone places. They're not getting paid sick leave. They're not getting access to, to testing. They're not getting isolation facilities and support that they need. And I think that that would be entirely more helpful and more constructive than telling people that they just need to stay home. I think people have known that they should be staying at home for weeks now. And while most students are learning remotely in Southern Ontario, special education students are still going to school, and so are the staff who support them. The president of Kipis Ontario's School Board Council of Unions is calling for more protections in schools. Yesterday's announcement that uh, excluded education workers uh, from the phase two of the vaccine, we were able to get a hold of them quickly and to push for that to be corrected. And by about nine o'clock last night, it had been revised. Uh, we really appreciate that. But we need real, true dialogue. We need uh, Minister Lecce to sit down with us to actually learn what happens in schools. And along with parents, uh, teachers, education workers, let's make a real plan that's sustain sustainable and safe. Now, next door in Quebec, the government is facing calls to exempt homeless people from its COVID-19 curfew. A member of the Quebec Solidaire Opposition Party says there have been reports that homeless individuals have been ticketed for violating the health order. The curfew requires people to stay home between 8 p.m. and 5 a.m. The party says it wants more flexibility for people on the street who are already disadvantaged. All right, since uh, 1039, two degrees, time for a check on weather and traffic. Our Bill Coulter's out there. Bill, you really, uh, you don't need the hat, you don't need the scarf, because we're really enjoying this unusual mid-January weather. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It feels more like Vancouver than Toronto in January. However, it's overcast, much like Vancouver usually is. Uh, so it's not a picture-perfect day, and I'm, I'm longing for a little bit more sunshine. The trade-off may be that we have to get a little bit more cold air in, in order to get that sunshine. Maybe that's not such a bad thing for a few days next week just to get that sunshine back overhead. Two degrees right now, northwesterly winds, they're light.
it feels like zero and that's well above where we should be even as an actual temperature for this time of day this time of year we should be heading to a high of just minus two and we're going to squeeze another couple of degrees out of today the wind chill is not a big deal now, a little bit of a story in terms of cloud cover maybe some showers holding on to central northern and northeastern lake erie other than that just an overcast day mild cloudy uh, tomorrow we do have a system rolling in it's going to impact us mostly in the mid late afternoon with rain overnight some mixing and then saturday we start to clear out and then begin to gracefully cool down back to normal i'll have those details coming up drive continues for you if you are planning travels if you have to do any essential travel the only thing you really need to be aware of is this some emergency maintenance eastbound on the 401 express to collector transfers right near the allen they remain blocked for this road work there's no eta on reopening the transfers but it is something worth noting the good news is that there's really no delay on the approach let's look at your east 401 express lanes through the dufferin stretch rest of the major routes like i said very quietly traveled off the major routes crews are dealing with this collision blocking traffic on davenport both ways west of Bathurst to Christie, TTC also diverting around that area. Nick, back to you. All right, thanks so much, Lisa. Yeah. Well, the city is presenting its budget today. Mayor John Tory says there won't be any major service cuts in the financial plan, but he also notes that this is not the time to bring in any large tax increases as people are still struggling during the pandemic. The capital budget is $1.3 billion, and that includes investments in infrastructure. The city has to balance the budget every year by law. 1041, two degrees. This is Toronto's breaking news, CB24. U.S. intelligence report suggests militia groups are planning on disrupting President elect Joe Biden's inauguration day. Those details are after the break. Covert for several months. The two have been held in China on espionage charges for more than two years. Their arrests widely viewed those retaliation for Canada's arrest of Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou on an extradition request from the U.S. Ottawa has condemned the, co the Michaels detention as arbitrary and is continuing to call for their immediate release. In the meantime, yesterday, Donald Trump became the first president in U.S. history to be impeached twice, but there's still plenty more to this story. So for more on what's developing in D.C., let's go live to see the 20 versions. Jamie, good for Jamie. Yeah, well, the president put out that video statement last night, Nick, where he strongly condemned the violence that took place on the U.S. Capitol last week and is also calling for peace in his final days of his presidency. And while many are saying that this was a very strong and direct message to his uh, to American people uh, to help really lower the rising tensions and the political climate uh, in America. Uh, there was a lot of questions about how much uh, duress the president might have been under to deliver that statement to help bring calm over the nation. In his address, Trump sends a direct message to his base of loyalists that, quote, no true supporter of mine could ever endorse political violence, disrespect law enforcement, or threaten or harass their fellow Americans. And while the video makes no reference to being impeached a second time, he took aim at what he's calling an attack on free speech and an effort to censor, cancel, and blacklist fellow citizens. Here's more from the president. I want to be very clear. I unequivocally condemn the violence that we saw last week. Violence and vandalism have absolutely no place in our country and no place in our movement. Making America great again has always been about defending the rule of law supporting the men and women of law enforcement and upholding our nation's most sacred traditions and values. Mob violence goes against everything I believe in and everything our movement stands for. Well, many are wondering where was that kind of message after the events in Charlottesville or after the murder of George Floyd and the BLM protests and riots last summer with the Senate impeachment trial on the horizon and even possible possible future criminal charges against the president. It appears as though he might be trying to position himself as a leader who's just trying to bring calm over a nation that appeared to be on the verge of chaos just one week ago after a mob of insurrectionists stormed the U.S. Capitol in an effort to stop the certification of Joe Biden's election victory. Uh, Meanwhile, uh, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell released a statement yesterday where he confirmed that he will not support a speedy Senate impeachment trial in the final days of the Trump presidency. In his statement, he goes on to say, even if the Senate process were to begin this week and move promptly, no final verdict would be reached until President Trump had left office. This is not a decision I am making. It is a fact. The president-elect himself stated last week that his inauguration on January 20th is the quickest path for any change in the occupants of the presidency. And Necker also hearing reports that the Trump could be preparing a slew of pardons in his final days of office, which could include uh, some of his staunch supporters, some of his family members, and even himself. However, there are, are several constitutional scholars and legal experts who are weighing in on whether or not he has the authority to do that while being impeached.
Back to you. What can you do in six days? All right, Jamie, thanks. Well, U.S. intelligence information suggests militia groups are planning to disrupt Inauguration Day. Reports say groups are considering blocking key bridges into Washington, D.C. and shutting down train stations. There could be up to 20,000 National Guard troops in the capital for Inauguration Week, which is more than we stationed in Iraq and Afghanistan. U.S. President Donald Trump has already announced he won't be there, but his Vice President Mike Pence is planning to attend. World Health Organization experts are in China to investigate the origins of the COVID-19 pandemic. 13 members of the team have arrived in the city of Wuhan, where the virus was first detected in late 2019. They are undergoing testing and will have to go through quarantine before they can start their field research. Two other team members are being retested in Singapore after they were found to have COVID-19 antibodies. The visit to China comes as the daily case, case counts in that country are at their highest level since July. And we'll have a check on the traffic and 7-day forecast around here coming up next. It's 1048, 2 degrees above zero, feeling like it's right out the freezing mark. You're watching Toronto's